Good morning. I'm Robert Kelly. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. If we have not yet met, I'm so glad uh, that you have come on out to join us for worship today. And for all of you, uh, welcome to the continuation of chapter two. Chapter two is both a series and an initiative. In, actual, in actuality, it is the single most important initiative in the life of Beacon since we began the church some nine years ago or so. In it, it captures, chapter two captures the rewriting of our spiritual DNA as a church. We're renewing our strengths and we are shoring up our weaknesses as a community of faith. And so as a part of this, it is also a time to create margin, margin in all sorts of areas so that we can have the resources that we need to rewrite the DNA and to continue to grow the church both spiritually and numerically and of course ultimately to find a new home. And we've been focusing for this series, a series you could think of it as an outline of the values of chapter two. We've been focusing on the five life practices that uh, are the marks of a fully devoted follower of Jesus, the five life practices. And so each week, uh, we're taking a couple of weeks and we're looking at each of these five uh, spiritual practices. And today we're gonna begin the conversation on what it looks like to love your spiritual family, love your spiritual family, the second one. So with global citizenship on the rise and 24-7 tw coverage of world events, constantly hitting our screens in real time, one might assume that people are identifying with more and more people, with others. But one might assume that incorrectly. As a nation with smaller families and larger houses, one could be led to believe that people have more time for their smaller families, and more space for their friends. One would be misled. In a world that is ever more connected with tweets and posts and snaps, you would imagine that we are entering into the golden age of connection and friendship, but you would be imagining wrong. How can it be with the seemingly endless barrage of ringings and beepings and vibratings and tingings that we could be increasingly isolated. It doesn't even seem to make sense, and yet the statistics say it is so. They say that most Western countries are finding that we are less likely to have strong friendships, to know our neighbors, or to be connected to our families than the generations that went before us. We are less connected. Now, of course, loneliness is already a well-documented and deadly reality for our nation's elderly. The University of Chicago professor, he said that he found that loneliness is twice as bad for the health of elderly people as obesity. We worry about their physical health like that, but we're now recognizing just how dangerous loneliness is. Surprisingly though, the Mental Health Foundation, a few years ago, they, they had done a research study and they found out that the, the 18 to 34 year old demographic, not the elderly, the 18 to 34 year olds were more likely to feel lonely, to worry about loneliness and to experience depression because of loneliness than even the elderly, 18 to 34 year olds. The National Science Foundation, they found that if you excluded family, more than half of respondents do not have someone with whom they can talk about their personal troubles or triumphs. Half. Which half? This half? Is it, or is it this half? Do you guys line up in that way? Is it, is it equally distributed, everyone? Imagine it this way. If you are a person who feels like you have that, just look around. Half don't. Half don't. 
We have, of course, by now, I think all of us have probably heard that social media generally reduces life satisfaction. This is always showing up in different news reports. Recently, NPR highlighted it again. They, they noted a University of Michigan study that was done on college students, and they found out that the more the college students used Facebook, the worse they felt. The more they used Facebook, the worse they felt. It was a published study, uh, and they, they were talking about uh, this Facebook despair. And there was a direct correlation in two areas. It led to declines in moment-to-moment -moment happiness and overall life satisfaction. So we've heard these kinds of things before. Fortunately, if you are feeling bummed, the researchers did a test and found a solution for this Facebook despair. You know what it is? Less Facebook, yes, that's actually it. I hope we paid a lot for that study because you know that, that was just insightful brilliance right there. The researcher said though, that face-to-face -face or phone interaction, what they called those outmoded analog ways of communication, had the opposite effect. That direct interactions with other human beings led people to feel better. Interestingly, in the last few decades, American violence has dropped in almost every category. That's great news. It's just dropping, dropping, dropping. We are a less violent people, except in one area, suicide. That is on the increase in many demographics. New York Times said that there is a strong link between suicide and weakened social ties. When people, especially men, get disconnected from society's core institutions, such as marriage and religion, or when faced with unemployment, their rates of suicide sharply increase. Middle age male, the the middle-aged male population has seen the fastest increase in suicide rates. Now, I don't know what middle age is. I just know I don't put myself in it. So I don't know if it's younger than me or old, I, I just whatever. It just doesn't sound like something I want to be a part of. So whatever it is, I don't really know. I don't even want you to tell me. So don't send me any articles about it or anything like that because I actually don't want to know. But I do find it somewhat disturbing that middle-aged male population, fastest increase. Nikki Forsyth, he's a psychotherapist. He said that we treat the networks that we have as incidental. That's how we treat them. We treat our networks as incidental. But they're fundamental to our well-being, fundamental to our well-being. See, of course, God knows this. God created the human creature. He understands our emotional, psychological, our spiritual needs, and he has, he has provided for us a community, a community, a place for us to experience and to express the love of Christ, the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones who are supposed to be knit together, your spiritual family. God knew this, and he provided for us. If you'd open up in the Bible, please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, that would be the text that we're going to be looking at here this morning. A famous text related to how the first Christians lived, what they did, and how they acted. Acts chapter 2. Speaking about the early Christians, starting in verse 42, chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Back up at verse 42. Devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. This is a great word. It shows up at least 10 times in the New Testament. Six of those times shows up right here in Acts. So it captures for us the kinds of things that the first Christians did. What did they devote themselves to? How did they act? And the word is really, it's, it's, uh, it shows up in a lot of different ways. It's used in a lot of different ways with all the same general idea. For instance, when a person gave steadfast attention to someone else, they were said to be devoted to them. When a person persevered, 
They didn't fail, they didn't faint. When they, they overcame, when they persevered, they were said to be devoted people. When in the early days, the missionaries from the church, they would travel throughout the Mediterranean. And every once in a while, they would go into an area and some people would be so dedicated, they would, they would be so impressed with their message and so uh, excited about this gift of God and salvation through Christ that they had heard that they would begin to follow the apostles around. They would attach themselves to them, so to speak. They would ceaselessly begin to follow them around. And they were said to have been devoted to them. In another place, if a person was called to a constant state of readiness to do good, constant state of readiness, a charge, an admonition, always be ready in whatever circumstances, whatever, always be ready to do some sort of good, they were said to be devoted people. And so if you give intense effort, despite the difficulty that you face, and you prove in those circumstances to be courageous, then you have been called devoted. You have been devoted to it. You see, being together as a spiritual family, this kind of togetherness that we're talking about, it isn't something that you can throw together at the last minute. It doesn't work that way. That's not what it means to be devoted to each other. It isn't a casual affair. It's not something you pick up on Sundays and you put down on Mondays. It is something that requires commitment and planning and execution on your part. If you want to be a person who says, I am devoted to these things, it will take effort, work on your part. And if we're to do that for each other, we're in a sense making promises to our spiritual family. So go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say, I am going to be devoted to you. Yes, feels good, right? I am going to be devoted to you. Turn to the person on your other side and say, I am going to be attentive to you and your needs. And now this one's a more difficult maneuver, but you're going to turn around to the person behind you and you're going to say, even if it is difficult or challenging, like turning around in my seat, I am going to stick with you. Go ahead and turn around. Even if it is difficult or challenging... I'm going to stick with you. Now, lean forward to the person in front of you and tell them, I am going to ceaselessly follow you around. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't do that one. Stalker. Stalker. No, don't do that one. They did this. They were devoted to gathering up together, and they did it in part by worshiping together. We see that in verse 46. Look at verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And this was a huge part of what they did, this communal worship experience. Now, we got this from the Jewish community. Now, the whole early church was Jewish. Right? You guys know this. Though. Mostly, mostly the entire first, all the early Christians, the whole church, it was Jewish. And so a lot of what we picked up, we've learned from how the Jews did worship in the first century, how Jesus himself would have worshiped in the first century. We have a lot that we have learned and can learn from the Jewish people. Actually, I heard a, a guy, he said he was, he recently drove around the U.S. He covered like 2,000 miles of U.S. roads. And he said that everywhere he went, he noticed these little shrines that show up on the side of the road when somebody has a car accident and dies. And he says, you know, he found just hundreds and hundreds over these 2,000 miles of these little shrines with just all of them almost always had crosses on them. All of them have crosses on them. He goes, in all of those 2,000 miles, he said only a couple of them had a star of David. Only a couple. Thousands seem to, hundreds have crosses, only a couple have a star of David. He says, you know, there's really only one logical conclusion that you can draw from this. That Jews are better drivers than Christians. <laughs> and I think that's pretty reasonable. I think, you see, because we can learn a lot from the history, not even what they used to, but even how they still, some of the emphasis they still have. You see, in the ancient world, it would have been very common for every people had religion, every people had a temple. It was just, it's part of the human, the yearning of the human soul. It's how God made us, to yearn for something other than ourselves, for something beyond us. And so every people has had religion. But often those temples were set up in such a way that you could come in privately and you could bring your sacrifice in order to 
win the favor of, you, of the gods. And so you would offer whatever animal or money you would need or, and you would be hopefully try to get the blessing of your god so he would bring rain to your land and give you a pretty wife and all this kind of stuff. Whatever, you know, war against your enemy, you know, this is, this is what you would do. But it was largely a private affair. But the Jews had a very vibrant communal worship life centered around the temple, the tabernacle before that, and of course, the Torah. And so they had, they had prayers and they had the psalms that they would sing and it would be some performance piece, but it would be others they would listen to and there would be prayers offered and there would be sacrifices and the people would sing with great joy and it would be a congregational kind of a thing. And this was very powerful for their community to help them keep their identity and to fight against the many people who had tried to oppress them over the years. This was a huge part of their identity. And of course, the early church picked up many of these exact things. And so for us, they went out to the temple to worship, but for us, we come out and we gather at buildings on Sundays, buildings like this one and the one in East Williston, and we gather up together and we do very similar things. We worship and we pray. We have a time for learning and we participate in our own religious ceremonies like the Lord's Supper. And we do it in order to increase the family life and the connection of being together. To, to, to enhance our identity and strengthen our relational bonds. By the way, one of the reasons we're looking at the new schedule, why we're going to be implementing on October 19th, the new schedule, one campus, the two services with more time in between, is to enhance this value, is to give us more time so that we can actually be a family together, that we can worship together, be together, share life together. And so it's helpful for you to begin to ask yourself, why do you come out to church? Like, why did you come out today? Or why, I mean, some of you are like, well, I got dragged here by my spouse. But, you know, if, if you weren't actually dragged here, if you actually came of your own accord, why? See, now, I understand for a lot of us, it's because, you know, we're looking for some spiritual boost to kind of make it through the week. And that's all right. That's fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with, with that kind of a motivation. But is that the only reason? Because I think we're falling short then. See, for others, it's, it has to do with a guilt from childhood or something like that. You know, I, I have to go to church because it's what my parents told me would happen or I'd go to hell. And so I have to go to church, otherwise God, he's, he's going to punish me or he won't, or at least he won't give me any blessings. I lost that big business deal because I missed church. You know, some people have these screwy kinds of ways of understanding it. We've all been there, so I understand it. You know, we, we have these ways of sort of negotiating with God and trying to manipulate his, his providence and all of this kind of stuff. But you see, often what we're doing is we're focusing on what we can get out of it. But that's not how we do family life, is it? If your family was only about what every individual can take from it, there is no family there. That's not how a family gathers up together. We don't go to Thanksgiving dinner with our family in order to, to just have a meal. There's something about the, the, the togetherness that's key. That's why we do it. And you see, for us too, what if we began to understand and experience our weekly gathering as our communal family worship time. How would things be different? You know, people wouldn't want to just kind of rush in at the last minute, miss a couple of the, the opportunities you have to worship during the week and rush out at the end. What if it meant you would be actually thinking, you know what? It's not simply what I'm going to get out of it, but it's also what I can give back to the broader community. Maybe there are some folks here that could use an encouraging word from you today. Maybe there's some folks here that, you know, maybe they need you to offer up some prayers or just a, a, a smile or handshake or what. Maybe, maybe it's just some friends who maybe they're casual acquaintances to you, but you don't realize that you're starting to become more important to them. And so you're, you're making opportunities to gather up together and to begin to see yourself as a participant and a giver to the broader community rather than simply trying to figure out what it is that you need to get out of it. We're told in other places not to forsake the assembling together of the saints. You know, and so for some of you, that means it, there are issues of priority here. You know, we all have, you know, hobbies or bouts of laziness or sports that want to draw us away from the gathering up together. But you know what happens when I stopped calling my dad and kind of checking in and letting him know that I'm alive and what's going on in my life? He rightly can call me out and say, what, your dad's not important to you anymore? And I could give him every excuse possible, but in the end, he is right. I have prioritized everything else above a simple phone call. He'd be right. 
Parents, you've felt this with your own kids. It happens. What if we don't view our spiritual family in this way? What if instead we come out and we are participating regularly and faithfully in such a way that because we realize that when we show up, we're seizing an opportunity to be together, to gather together, to do what God has for us and to be knit together in this way, to worship together. They also were learning together. You see that in verse 42. They were learning together. In verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. This is why at Beacon we are a Bible-focused and sort of application-driven community. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. The Christian churches have long tried to figure out what the scriptures mean and, of course, how to apply them to our lives, what they mean for us today. And a great deal of energy and resource and time, money goes into the communal learning experiences here at Beacon. But of course, there's more than, than simply coming on out and doing it here on a Sunday morning. This is why we talk about growth groups. You know, the, the, the Jewish people, they mastered this whole learning community kind of thing. There was all sorts of conversation and give and take and, and debate about the Torah. To this day, it's still a big part of of the Jewish spiritual life. And we can benefit from that same kind of a thing. To be able to get together with a group of people who are going to be focused on applying the things that we're learning in church to, to our own lives to hold accountable to. We're talking about these, besides growth groups, we're talking about launching these discipleship groups, these discipleship communities. We're super excited about that. In the next few months, we're going to be rolling out more and more of these even smaller groups where people are going to be committed to learning together, becoming more and more like Christ, and holding each other accountable to that. Why? Because learning together is a key part. If we're devoted to learning together, we will be loving each other in it. And I think that something truly great takes place in that communal learning, in the give and the take and the discourse and the questions and the accountability. It's really something truly powerful. They were also praying together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. And many times in the book of Acts, the first Christians were found praying. Many, many. One of their most common things that they engaged in was prayer. They prayed at the temple. They prayed in their homes. They prayed in their prison cells. They prayed for their persecutors. They prayed for themselves. They prayed for each other. They prayed for lost people who were far from God. Constantly, they prayed. And what would it be like if we added prayer into our relationships with each other? What would it be like that if instead of just sharing stories with each other or worrying or worse, complaining, what if we stopped and we spent some of that time in prayer? You know, I think that this can be a challenging practice to add to our relationships, but I think it's an essential part of learning to love. Now, for women, now I know gender broad brushing is always taboo, and so here I go. But women, there can be a lot of words in your relationships. There can be a lot of words. So you're hanging out with your girlfriends, and there can be a whole lot, just a lot of talking, a lot of going back and forth. What if you decided to tithe 10% of those words back to God? So like in any given 10-minute conversation, what if, as if that ever happened, but let's say you had a 10-minute conversation. What if you gave a minute back to prayer. What if in the midst of an hour, you said, you know what, let's not finish our conversation before we, we pray for each other. What would it be like? How would your relationships begin to shift and deepen if we made it a normal part of our lives? What if after hanging out and having supper and doing some things, playing board game night or whatever, you just grabbed a few minutes to pray together? A lot, a lot of things come up in the midst of conversation. A lot of struggles and triumphs, things that you can thank God for and things that you can ask for his help for. To pray for each other in this way, it would knit us together so powerfully. I know for, especially for men, this could be a very, very awkward kind of a thing to add. Uh, the idea of it, you know, this, this for many men to ask to pray for one of their buddies, it just feels like, no, never, no. I think I'd rather have my teeth ripped out. I think a lot of guys, you know, which is funny because, of course, you know, we do all sorts of other weird, like you go to a sporting game, you start yelling, and screaming, hollering, you strip half naked, you paint your body all sorts of colors. That's okay. 
that's normal. But praying together for a buddy who's hurting? No, that's where, that's where we draw the line at awkward and weird. It's funny how we, how we sort of view these things. Imagine what that would be like for men to actually support each other in this way. Listening to the heart of another person and then meeting them there in prayer before God. They also were fellowshipping together. In verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to apostles' teaching, to prayer, and of course, to fellowship and to breaking of bread. That idea shows up again in the second half of verse 46b. Uh, 46, it says, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together. Now, the breaking of bread, by the way, it sounds like communion. It probably isn't. It's probably related to more of the ancient Near East custom of, of sharing a meal. There's a huge importance in the ancient world on this shared meal. The breaking of bread together was something that went beyond this table for Christians. It was actually the sharing of life. There are all sorts of rules that governed it and how we would relate to each other and don't violate the trusts given to you and all of this kind of stuff. But it was a wildly important part of ancient life because it was part of the social fabric of a society. Now, I think that Christian churches have, of course, long been known as social places. Churches even have rooms dedicated to it that we call Fellowship Hall. If you've been around the old school, it's Fellowship Hall because we take the very word itself and that's where we're going to go and fellowship. And we do potlucks and we have lots of casserole dishes and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, maybe we picked that up from the Jews who to this day still like their nosh. Or maybe we picked it up in part from Jesus who always seemed to be partying. You know, at least one time he brought the wine. We, we know that. He was called a, a drunkard and a glutton and all that kind of stuff. I heard a story about a church that had a picnic, kind of one of their social events. And at one side of the table, you know, they gathered up the whole community and there was a whole giant crowd there. And the pastor had put a, uh, a big pile of apples in a bowl. And he had a sign on it that said, um, please take only one apple. Remember, God is watching. And then, of course, down on the other end of the table, they have all the food. And at the other end there was this giant pile of cookies. And one of the kids had decided to make that one his note. And so he wrote a note to match the pastors. It said, uh, you know, please take as many cookies as you want. God is watching the apples. So, <laughs> so as long as God's watching the apples, you can feel free to enjoy cookies and hang out and eat until your heart's content. Because God's watching the apples. So, and I think we as a church, we want to do this more and more. More social activities and more opportunities to just hang out and be together. And we're going to try to create a brand new connect team kind of in line with the outreach team. And they're going to focus on doing large scale and small scale events to just give us time to be together. You know, I think that's great. It's important. It's key. However, the word here is koinonia. Koinonia, fellowshipping. Can you guys say that with me? Koinonia. Koinonia. This is a key word. It's an important concept in the New Testament. It's a powerful concept. And it has to speak, of, it speaks about commonality. You see, it isn't just about nosh and hanging out and making some friends. It's much deeper than that. It talks about a type of unity of life rooted in the, the one faith that we have and the one life that we share in God and the unity we have with God and with each other because of the shared faith and salvation that we've all experienced through Christ. And so this, this is something far more deep and it's marked by a genuine sort of sacrificial love. This koinonia isn't just hanging out and, and having some fun. It's about spiritual friendships. Spiritual friendships where Christ always seems to rise to the surface of the conversations. It's the kind of a spiritual friendship where it isn't awkward for a guy to tell his buddy, it's, why don't we spend a little bit of time and pray? The kind of thing where people feel the support and the encouragement and the love of another person who truly knows them, which is, of course, what the soul really wants, to be known and still loved. I think, by the way, growth groups this week uh, are going to be discussing this very idea more fully. They're going to study all of the occurrences of koinonia this week. So if you're in a growth group, you don't want to miss it. You want to be committed to your growth group because you're going to be studying this idea of koinonia and seeing how to apply it in your... By the way, if you're not in a growth group, you're missing out because we are extending the teaching from the Sunday morning into the growth groups on a regular basis and you're able to take it and things that I'm not able to fully develop and apply here on a Sunday morning. 
And of course, they ended with glad and sincere hearts in verse 46, with glad and sincere hearts and praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved, which is, of course, not surprising because where isolation and loneliness are banished and where sacrificial love for each other and togetherness is woven in, it produces glad and sincere hearts. And why is it that the Lord was adding to their number daily? Because who wouldn't want to be a part of that kind of spiritual family? When they began to see how they acted and treated and loved each other, of course, they would grow. And so the question is, what will you do? What will you do? Are you going to be committed to loving your spiritual family? Are you going to be devoted to them in significant ways? To get together in worship and learning and praying and hanging out and koinoniaing, however you do that. Because if you're going to, it's going to take initiative on your part. You know, I'd love it if that weren't the case. I would love it if every single person who walked through the doors of the church was simply sucked in irretrievably to this koinonia kind of community, that it would be impossible to even escape, except in our sinful and fragmented and isolated and individualistic world, that simply isn't our reality. If you want to do it, if you want to be a part of it, you'll need to take some initiative toward that end. See, it isn't just, it's easy to stand on the sidelines and say, well, you know, I never really got connected. I was never really able to get folded in. You know, I tried this thing or that thing once or twice, and it really never really worked for me. I couldn't find anyone. I hear what you're saying. Sometimes it can be challenging. I'm not saying everybody, we always nail this and get it right all the time. What I am saying, it is still your responsibility to love your spiritual family. It is still something that you are called to do, to be devoted to each other in this way. You need to create these things. You need to figure out how to make this happen. It isn't just about you. It's also about others with you and through you and because of you. Or maybe for you, you're going to say, you know what? It's not just initiative. I'm going to just be there for my spiritual family in increasing ways. I'm going to be more faithful in my attendance. I'm going to get there early. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to find out ways to be connected to this group of folks. I'm going to share my life with them. I'm going to give myself. Or maybe it's prioritizing your growth group. Maybe you say, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure I never make, or I'm going to get into one because I'm not in one. Who knows? Each of us has different ways. You know, or maybe for you, and this would be great to hear, maybe you're going to decide for this week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I have one awkward prayer moment with one of my, one of my brothers and sisters here in Christ. One awkward prayer moment. That's all I'm asking, one awkward prayer moment. I want to hear stories where you guys say, hey, so, uh, you know, you're hanging out, you're talking, you just finished your beer and wings, and you're like, so, uh, buddy, mind if we pray for your host? <laughs> I'll just pray quietly and quickly. Can I pray for you, you know? I want to hear about it. I want to hear how it goes. I want to see, you know, we talk about man, men and being courageous and all of these kinds of things, and it's like, well, let's see what it takes to have one awkward prayer time with a friend who might desperately need it this week. Maybe you'll get together with someone that you want to develop a spiritual friendship with. The point is this, listen. Imagine what it would be like for us to look to Acts chapter 2 and figure out what chapter 2 for Beacon is going to look like. What if we can begin here and say that the sharing of our life together, lives together, the sharing of our burdens and our blessings, our heartache and our joy became a normal part? What if because of the community that we are forming here, we're able to beat back the loneliness of our age with this timeless provision of God. Imagine what kind of a place that would be, filled with glad and sincere hearts. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, we're asking that you would make this more and more true of us. We've done so many things in these areas, and we've excelled in so many ways, and yet we have come up short uh, as well. And we know, Lord, that you desire us to be devoted to each other, to gather up together in significant ways, sharing our lives and our, our stories, our hearts, pressing past the superficial and getting to what really matters, the issues of the soul, these spiritual friendships. Lord, I pray that we would be together uh, in these kinds of ways. We ask it in Christ's name.